My name is uh, Dr. Kieran Began. I'm a geophysicist at the British Geological Survey and I specialise in geomagnetism and that's what the kind of main uh, thrust of this talk would be today. So I start off with this nice uh, zoom background which is the aurora behind us and um, it's one of the sort of few visible manifestations of the um, Earth's magnetic field. I'll just turn it off for a second so that uh, you don't get distracted by it. The other one you might be quite familiar with is one of these things which is a compass. Okay, so the aurora tend to be seen around the northern uh, hemisphere and around the southern hemisphere, around the polar regions. And as we all know, hopefully that compass tends to point towards true uh, magnetic north in the north hemisphere or magnetic south in the southern hemisphere. And these two places are not aligned. There's normally a difference between magnetic north where compass points and true north where the uh, Earth's rotation axis is. So why is that? And uh, why, why does it move all the time? That's kind of my main um, topic of the talk today. So the, the difference between true north and magnetic north is often called declination. It's an, an angle normally up between sort of zero and sort of 30 degrees anywhere you are in the world. But the thing about the Earth's magnetic field is um, it's actually of course generally invisible um, although it has had a small influence on us. Um, but it sort of penetrates everything uh, from the centre of the Earth out into space before it meets the Sun's magnetic field so sort of, um, compresses against it. Um, so the Earth forms this the magnetic field forms bubble around the Earth. So most people um, are quite familiar with the sort of general sort of shape of the magnetic field, and typically we we use uh, oops, right. we use um, bar magnets to uh, sort of represent how the field looks. So you're quite familiar; it's got a north pole and a south pole, and most people know that the north and the south poles will connect, but turn them around and they'll sort of tend to push each other apart. They don't like being connected. So those are the kind of main properties of magnetic fields, they've got generally got two poles at least, sometimes they've got even more poles. Now the thing about the Earth's magnetic field is actually really really weak um, in general. So one of these bar magnets is literally a thousand times stronger than, uh, oops, than the, um, the Earth's magnetic field. So it's really easy to move a compass needle and um, in fact to overwhelm the Earth's magnetic field is generally quite easy with any kind of its electronics and so on. But the bar magnet has this um, well-known dipole shape and what I've got is a bar magnet placed inside uh, this box here with iron filings. And you can see that uh, they've nicely spiked out. So actually the magnetic field sort of looks like a sort of dumbo shaped or elephant ears as I always think about them. And if I take my kind of rather poorly constructed pipe cleaner, you can imagine that the magnetic field lines look a little bit like this. So if, if they're not contained, they extend out quite a long way and then back in again. This sort of, and those go all the way around and forms this standard kind of like uh, circular shape that uh, you tend to see with bar magnets. Okay, so um, I'm guessing that's most people's understanding of what the Earth's magnetic field looks like, it's sort of that, but bigger. Um, but there's a few problems with that. Um, uh, because if the Earth's were, the magnetic field were just made by a pure bar magnet, then it would never change because the bar magnet doesn't move around the Earth, it would just be fixed in place. So how does the North Pole move in that case? And how does the magnetic field vary over the course of the Earth? Um, we know from hundreds of years of measurements at geomagnetic observatories, these are places where we measure the strength and direction of the field, that the field is constantly shifting over time. Uh, and on longer time scales, we can look at things like lava flows, and we can see that the magnetic field embedded in the lava flow when it cools down um, is actually reversed in certain areas. Um, so we know that the magnetic field itself can fully reverse back and forward over millions of years. And finally, we know that as you go down into the Earth, it gets hotter. And as you go further and further down, it gets above uh, what's called a Curie temperature. And that's the temperature at which a magnet loses its magnetization. So if you heated this magnet above about 500 degrees, it would lose its magnetization. Um, when you go to the centre of the Earth, you're looking at 5,000 degrees. Um, that's how hot it is right at the centre of the Earth. So how could a bar magnet hold its magnetisation if that was uh, the temperature down in the centre of the Earth? So all, all these problems mean that actually a, a permanent magnet can't be the solution to how the Earth has a magnetic field, even if it's a really big one. So the first person to sort of suggest a solution to this um, was actually Edmund Halley of Comet fame back in the 1700s. And um, he, uh, he suggested that maybe there's a liquid layer inside the centre of the Earth. Um, and uh, that was kind of uh, unproven until about 1906 when seismologists um, realised that there must be a liquid layer in the centre of the Earth. 
And what, what they noticed was, I'll get my next prop, was that, uh, here's, my, here's my model of the earth, was that if you had an earthquake, let's say in uh, New Zealand, let's pick New Zealand, uh, what you'd see is the earthquake would be detectable in seismometers in a sort of ring around the earth here, but on the far side of the planet, and um, you would not detect the earthquake, say in America. Okay, so this meant that there was obviously some sort of liquid layer that was damping out the signal from the earthquake, the, the shaking as it went through the earth, um, and that was called the outer core. So we now know from you know another hundred years of seismological evidence that actually the earth can be divided into sort of these four general layers. So you've got the crust on the outside, so that's kind of the land and the sea and the rocks that we're familiar with. And then below that, there's a layer called the mantle. And the mantle is um, a, a kind of made of a particular kind of rock, olivine and uh, pyroxenes, um, and it's about halfway to the centre of the Earth. So that's about 3,000 kilometres. And then in the centre of the Earth, about uh, 3,000 kilometres to the centre, uh, is made of uh, the outer core, and that's made of liquid iron mostly and solid iron right at the centre. So um, this, if you think about it in sort of, uh, planetary terms, the outer core is about the size of Mars, and the inner core, which is solid metal bit, is about the size of the Moon. So if you think about it, there's a ball the size of the Moon that you see out in your clear night windows, made of solid iron, sat right in the centre of the Earth. So um, the outer core is liquid iron, and we know that from looking at meteorites, that um, meteorites that you can find that are iron stone meteorites, and um, they're about 90% um, iron and nickel. And then the rest of the core is 10% other stuff, which we think is maybe stuff like silicon or oxygen or lithium and stuff like that. Light elements that are kind of trapped when they're trained by the, the formation of the earth. Okay, um, so uh, what's next? Yes, so uh, you might wonder why this, this is still liquid if it's under such a huge amount of pressure, because obviously the weight of the mantle and the crust sit on top of the outer core. So the answer is, it is under a huge amount of pressure, but it's also very, very hot. It's at three or 4,000 degrees uh, centigrade. When you get right to the center, then the pressure does uh, increase, and that means that it's, um, uh, if you squeeze something that's liquid, it will eventually become a solid and um, under high enough pressure. And so that's the reason why you've got this solid inner core um, in the center of the earth. Um, so the interesting thing though is that um, even though this is under huge amounts of pressure and it's made out of liquid iron, it's actually considered to be very, very uh, low viscosity or very runny. So how runny is it? Well, it's about as runny as water is. Okay, so that's that's how runny the outer core is, the liquid outer core. So it flows really, really easily. Yeah, and um, like the oceans do on the surface of the earth. Okay, so there's a big liquid ball of hot metal flowing like the oceans do on the surface. But of course, it's trapped inside um, a, a, a ball, so it's inside a container, unlike the oceans, which are kind of free to move, uh, although they are, they're not trapped by the air, they are trapped by the, the seabed. Um, but the thing about it is when you've got something that is so liquid like that, with the earth spinning once per day, and there's other effects going on. It means the whole thing is quite turbulent and it um, is sort of moving about really, really easily. Now, the other thing about liquid iron is um, it's actually very, very conductive. Um, it's more conductive than a copper uh, wire. And if you think about it, here's, here's my phone charger. Copper wire is very conductive, so electricity flows really easily along that. And when you get electricity flowing along a wire, particularly if it's a loop, it generates a magnetic field small magnetic field, but magnetic field. That magnetic field actually looks quite a lot like this bar magnet. Okay, so an electrical loop, sorry, my uh, with a current flowing through it generates a dipole field. So let's bring all this together. You've got um, a very conductive liquid flowing really rapidly um, and under high temperature and pressure in the center of the earth. Now, if there's an existing magnetic field, a magnetic field inside a conductive uh, medium actually generates an electric field or an electric current. Um, and this is a little bit like a bicycle dynamo. So we think of a bicycle dynamo as the wheel turns, it rotates the dynamo, which is a magnet inside a copper wire that generates electricity to run your bicycle lights like. But a secondary effect is you get a small amount of additional magnetic field. And this is what happens in the earth the motion of the liquid iron 
uh, creates energy, uh, or well, it is energy, and that energy is converted into electricity, which flows around the outer core because it's conductive. And that electricity on a large scale looks a little bit like a wire, and that generates a magnetic field that escapes the core and goes out through the earth into space. So it's called the geodynamo because it's like a bicycle dynamo, but it's in the center of the earth. Okay, so that, that's a strange thing to think about that the Earth's magnetic field is actually just a kind of minor byproduct of the electricity flowing around the center of the Earth. So that's where the magnetic field comes from. So that helps to explain um, why the uh, magnetic field changes over time because the electricity flowing around the core changes over time. So, um, why, why does it, well, why does the magnetic field move then? Well, the magnetic field is sort of entrained in that fluid flowing around the outer core. And we know from making measurements on the surface of the Earth that the magnetic field drifts about, about 20 kilometers per year. And if you break that down, that's about 15 meters per day or about two meters per hour. And I, I, I looked this up on Wikipedia and that's about the average speed of a snail. So the magnetic field literally moves at a snail's pace. Of course, that's an average. In some parts of the world it moves faster, like in the North Polar region at the moment and other parts of the world, it hardly changes at all, like in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so why does it reverse? Okay, well, here, here's my next poorly made prop. So if you imagine this green uh, loop is the current flowing around the center of the Earth, and that's the magnetic field uh, with sort of white being the north bit and red being the south bit. And um, if you remember, if I use standard physics, there's this thing called the right-hand rule, which says that if the current is flowing in that direction, then the magnetic field points up. So over time, what must happen in the outer core is that the current, for whatever reason, reverses its direction, and then the magnetic field will flip over slowly, so it becomes the other way around. Oops, that's terrible. Like that. Okay, so that's how the magnetic field reverses, and that normally takes thousands of years, so it's not a quick process, it's a slow process, and it must be to do with the way the fluid within the outer core reconfigures itself. Okay, um, so the last thing I would touch upon is why sort of I have a job, and, and the reason is because um, we measure, we make maps of the Earth's magnetic field. Now, um, we try and forecast how that magnetic field will change in the next five years. Um, and it's a little bit like weather forecasting in the sense that um, you're trying to forecast a very chaotic system. So the atmosphere is very chaotic. Small changes will mean that your forecast quickly becomes poor. And in the case of the atmosphere, it becomes poor after about three or four days. In the case of trying to forecast the magnetic field from the core, it becomes poor after about five years. So every five years, we update these maps. And we, we do that by making uh, observations continuously at geomagnetic observatories, the three of those in the UK that we BGS run. And we use an instrument like this. This is called a proton precession magnetometer. This measures the absolute strength of the field. So we've got one of these in each of our observatories. And we take these kind of measurements and measurements with satellite and we run them through a, a big computer and there's some uh, complicated maths involved and you can spit out at the end a map of the angle between true north and magnetic north, this sort of declination angle. So, so you might be familiar with this. Um, if you've ever used one of these maps, um, there's often a, uh, a little bit in the corner, let me find it, here, which indicates the difference between true north, magnetic north, and magnetic north. And so the BGS, uh, me, and my colleagues contribute to uh, providing that information to Ordnance Survey, which you can then use you know, one of these uh, compasses to work out where you're going um, on the Earth. Now, of course, most people don't really use compasses and maps, uh, paper and, and actual physical compasses. They're more likely to have one of these, which of course is a smartphone. Most smartphones have a, an inbuilt digital compass in them, uh, as well as you know, applications like Google Maps or, or Apple Maps. And, we provide these maps uh, of the declination angle around the world for free and people like Google and Apple take them and embed them into the software. So you probably unknowingly have used some BGS uh, maps in the past without even realizing it. So when you look at a map like this, um, here I've got one prepared. So you see a little dot um, where uh, you are and there's a little cone kind of um, showing you the direction that your phone is facing in. Um, and so what has happened there is that the magnetic compass has worked out where magnetic north is and Google have a map that's orientated towards true north so the compass will uh, oh, sorry, the map application will take 
the details for the BGS declination maps and automatically just rotate your map so that it's all aligned up to the same direction. So you, as you walk along, you're, you're walking along the street correctly. So in some places of the world, the correction is very small. The declination angle in the UK is about zero at the moment, zero degrees. But if you're in, say, California, it can be 15, 20 degrees. And parts of, say, the world around South uh, America, it can be up to sort of 30 degrees, which is you know, a reasonably large correction if, if you weren't um, taking account for it. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this final thought um, about the Earth's magnetic fields. Uh, every time you make a measurement, and you turn on your applica application, and what you're actually doing is you're probing the magnetic field right at the center of the earth. Okay. So there you go. Every time you use your phone, you're actually doing my job. You're being a geophysicist. So I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us this uh, short webinar on Doors Open Day. Um, I hope I was suitably informative and not too confusing. If you do want some more information, um, please feel free to go to the BGS website, that's uh, www.bgs.ac.uk. You search for the geomagnetism mini website, you'll find a lot more information about uh, the geomagnetism um, capability, as it's called now, on, on that site. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions now. If anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat and I'm happy to answer those. So thank you. Hi, Kieran. Um, it's Claire, one of your colleagues from BGS. Um, I actually do have a question, just, just a bit more about your general day-to-day -to -day job. So could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what, what kind of things do you do as, as a geophysicist in your job? Oh, gosh, I, I, do, I do a fairly diverse suite of things. So um, depending on what time of the year it is, um, we can be concentrating on, on making these maps of the Earth's magnetic fields, um, and that generally takes about two months or so um, to gather in all the data and sort of clean it up and run it through one of our supercomputers that we have uh, in the BGS uh, to create from all the measurements that we make around the world, one of these maps. Um, and then other bits are sort of research about trying to understand, well, can um, we make the forecast better if we understand some of the physics that goes on in the center of the earth. Um, other times my job was uh, looking at the hazard actually from the earth's magnetic field to technology and what, where that comes about is that the aurora um, are driven by the sun's magnetic field and if the sun's magnetic field uh, gets very strong it can um, sort of erupt these storms, solar storms you might have heard of them, which generates um, additional energy that gets dumped into the earth's atmosphere um, and that creates electrical currents in the atmosphere above our heads and that generates large magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields can cause problems to transformers for example. Um, so some of my research is related to that. Um, most of what I do is actually, um, you know, on the computer, you know, um, pro coding, dealing with data. So the kind of data aspect of that. Um, and then very occasionally I do get to go out and do actual field work. We, we do measure the Earth's magnetic field, but that, that's relatively rare. So one of my first questions, has COVID affected day-to-day uh, -day work? Um, yes and no. So in terms of the observatories are generally fairly automatic. They were run for months and months without much, you know, um, maintenance required. But they do need kind of maintenance every, you know, six to months to a year. Um, so we've had to leave a lot of that. And you know, as things start to kind of degrade or break, um, then we do have to go and occasionally fix them. But you know, you need to do a fair amount of risk assessment um, to, in order to be sure that everything's safe. Um, and uh, some of the other field work, the actual field work where you literally go to the fields, um, has been disrupted. But we're starting to go back out again and do little bits now and then. I've got another question. What practical disruptions would we cause if the poles flipped? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, if the poles were to flip, you know, overnight, there would be huge repercussions for things like uh, satellite technology because they, they are, uh, they, they tend to use the magnetic field of the Earth to kind of shield them from the, the effects of the sun. Um, but what actually happens is the, the magnetic field would slowly decay over time, over a thousand years. And rather than completely disappear, it would just sort of form lots of small local magnetic north and south poles. Um, and they could be anywhere on the earth. Um, and then slowly what happens is over the next few thousand years, the, the field will sort of regrow back in the opposite direction. So I think the practical applications would be, disruptions would probably be minimal because you know, technology changes so rapidly that we could design in any issues that we were finding um, over the course of thousands of years. Um, 
so I, I, you know, I, I don't think there would be any kind of major disruptions because it would happen so slowly that you know, within your lifetime or my lifetime, or uh, let's say 80 to 100 years, you wouldn't really see that much of a change. And what, what kind of would be nice though is that the aurora would start to probably form um, at much lower latitudes. So most people around the world would actually get to see the aurora occasionally. Um, and of course, it would keep me in a job because we'd have to update the maps every every year rather than every five years so that they, they were kept up to date. Uh, so there's a question here, sorry, I'll, I'll just answer this. Do, would birds fly north rather than south? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I think birds automatically correct uh, for the change of the magnetic field every year. Um, there's, there's some researchers in St Andrews that I'm working with and they're trying to work out how birds do actually use the magnetic field. Um, and there's, there's um, for example, geese in kind of um, the Netherlands that would just take off and then fly straight to Siberia. They don't deviate, they just go straight. So they must use the magnetic field somehow. I think because the magnetic field changes so slowly, birds will be able to adapt, you know, because year on year, they, you know, presumably, they don't just use the magnetic field, they, they use visual cues as well, um, stars and so on, people believe. Um, so, so they would be able to kind of correct for it uh, every year so that they wouldn't be um, you know, turning kind of the wrong way as, as they took off, for example. Um, and then another question in chat. Um, how does the flipping of the field work and why does it change direction? So this, this is a, um, a very complicated question in the sense of how to actually answer it. But, but the, the simple kind of a way I was trying to get you to think about it is that the, if this green current represents the flow of electricity in a large loop inside the outer core, then it will generate a magnetic field um, that has, let's say, the red part is uh, the north pointing or bit and the white part the south pointing if over you know a few thousand years the flow of the core reverses then the electric field might flow in the opposite direction in which case the whole thing would just flip over and then the white bit is now the north pole and, and the red bit is now the south so so that that's essentially how it flows the actual physics of that is extremely complicated and in fact, um, we can't even run a kind of realistic model on supercomputers because, because of the main thing is actually because it's so difficult to model a very large scale uh, liquid, uh, which is this runny um, in, the, in a supercomputer because it just requires so much computing power. So, um, that, so we understand roughly how it, it reverses and you can get computer models to show that behavior for reversal. Um, from, from the physical um, flow of electrical current, but, but to sort of forecast it in detail is just really, really difficult. Uh, let's see, another question. Um, right, uh, how does, oh, does that explain the Cretaceous normal supercron period with no magnetic reversals? Um, so the, the Cretaceous supercron um, was this period um, about uh, I guess 65 million years ago. Uh, so between about 100 million years ago, about 65 million years ago, um, there, is, there were no magnetic field reversals um, for about 40 million years. And in modern times, the last 5 million years, on average, the field has been reversing about four times every million years. So the explanation of that, that kind of is most kind of generally accepted, is that um, the mantle controls the amount of heat that escapes from the outer core, because the outer core is trying to cool down from the formation of the earth, but their mantle acts as a blanket. And um, what we think happens is that plates um, from the surface, the, these kind of you know, the giant plates where subduction zones occur, like in Japan or in, in South America, uh, these plates can perhaps maybe go into the mantle and then break off and then sort of over millions of years fall to the bottom of the mantle and that these would blanket the mantle. Um, when the mantle is blanketed, or, or maybe the opposite case, actually cooled, because the, the, the rock from the surface is actually cooler than the um, surrounding rock. So this changes the kind of amount of heat that can escape from the outer core. And that might explain why the outer core's behavior changes over time, because the mantle is having uh, an influence on it and changing how the heat flows out of it. So perhaps during the Cretaceous Supercon, a plate sat on the outer core 
cool it down sufficiently that it made the behavior of the core more stable over time rather than it is at the moment where it's sort of quite chaotic. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> but basically the mantle seems to have a control over the outer core and how often it reverses. I'm not seeing any further questions. So um, yes, thank you everybody very much for coming along and attending and I hope this is informative and gave you some food for thought. <laughs> <laughs>